some games you instantaneously love. It takes nothing to get into and you're just there. And some are not that way. Not necessarily that they're bad, but that they're an acquired taste. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks 10 great games you absolutely hate at first. Starting off with number 10, I know that there are people out there who will say they love this game instantaneously. In fact, I am one of them. But there is nothing else like Death Stranding. It defies all genre expectations and was incredibly divisive when it came out. Death Stranding came out during peak walking simulator backlash and wowie did it get called that. Compared to something like the Metal Gear Solid series which is much more traditionally structured and saying Metal Gear Solid is traditionally structured compared to something is <laughs> it's a lot. But Death Stranding is crazy weird and it's super off-putting in the first few hours. It doesn't help that most of the tools you eventually get that make travel more fun take quite a while to unlock. Thanks uh, for watching. The game more info really is in the description. Please subscribe, by like, around. comment, and share. If the game had come out not much later, we probably would have called it the COVID FedEx Guy Simulator. And I'm sure some people probably did anyway. Uh, but I guess the FedEx guys did have a big advantage over our man, uh, vehicles immediately. <laughs> a lot of people just got in this game and were like, you're walking around, huh? That's the game? It's a bunch of walking? Wow. And then they put it down after a few hours. It's totally different from what you would expect from a big budget game. Uh, video games have trained us to expect big bombastic action right from the get-go, dropping you in the deep end, so to speak, even if they don't really. They at least give you the appearance of being dropped in the deep end. In Death Stranding, the deep end is more of a mental thing. There is action occasionally, but it's more about the strange meditative atmosphere and really just hauling stuff around. 90% of the game is hauling stuff. I mean, that's maybe a bit of an oversimplification, but you could call it that. Eventually, you start building up roads and zip lines, and getting around gets so much faster, but at the root, it's still a glorified game of truck simulator, and by default, you're walking rather than driving a truck. And that's the reason the game got a lot of backlash when it first came out. A lot of people really didn't know what to make of it. But if you're willing to take this game on at its own pace, it is a really full of depth and interesting. It's completely bonkers in every possible way. But over time, lots of things begin to reveal themselves as extremely interesting and well-designed. Uh, not, not bonkers though, it's bonkers. And number nine is Days Gone. Here's a game at the total opposite of the spectrum. Back when it first came out, reviewers were not kind to it, like, at all. Seriously, like, go back through some of the reviews. Some of the stuff was really scathing. Uh, recently, it's gotten kind of a critical reevaluation, and there's a lot of people who actually like it a lot, and for good reason. Days Gone does not make a good first impression, though. They throw a lot of nonsense at you in the first few hours, the main guy's goofy name, Deacon St. John, like, that literally sounds like a character in one of the always sunny gangs, various terrible movies. The zombies are called Freakers, which, I mean, is still funny. And the opening hours of the story are just the least interesting hours of the story. The main guy, Deke, starts off pretty unlikable. He's constantly angrily muttering and is just unpleasant. Deke! How's it going, brother? You ready? Not yet. I still gotta find a way in the Willie's garage. Gotta be a few pop inside. Up. Most of the characters, uh, other than him, feel pretty stock as far as zombie game archetypes go. The first few hours really just aren't that interesting. And you combine that with all the standard open world gameplay, and I can see why a lot of people were not keen on it early on. But if you stick with it, it does get more interesting. The story starts to pick up by introducing more uh, characters that you don't just automatically hate. Deke, he starts to chill out, and the actual gameplay starts to get a little more intriguing. It takes a long time before you get the chance to take on an actual zombie horde, but these fights are the highlight of the game. In certain locations, there's just hundreds of zombies, all at once. And 
and you got to clear him out. It's these moments where the gameplay really shines. There's really nothing else quite like it. And you're able to go absolutely nuts with your weapons in a way that's just not possible early in the game. Or really in a lot of games, period. What starts off pretty standard gets better and better as it goes. And the first few hours are tough to get through. But that doesn't mean it doesn't get good. Hova Deek! And number eight is XCOM 2. Uh, not that the game is weird or anything, or even boring. That's not why people hate it at first. It's just really hard. Even on normal, most players experience with this game is they start a new game, play for a few hours, and find themselves in an unwinnable position and restart. XCOM 2 is a tactical strategy game with a few layers less than an ogre two main layers specifically. There's tactical combat where you control a squad, which performs missions, uh, probably the bulk of what you're thinking about when you think of XCOM. Getting it done. And a strategic layer where you expand your base, research technology, and decide which missions to take on next. Basically, it's XCOM 1 with a few additional twists that make it pretty difficult, particularly at the beginning. Those first few hours are really unforgiving. You have very limited resources, not a lot of soldiers to work with, so if one of your good ones gets injured, blah, 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 you're basically screwed. Most missions include some kind of time limit, and when it runs out, you either get infinite enemy reinforcements or you just fail the mission instantly. Part of the challenge is just learning what you should be researching and building first. The enemy is always getting harder, and if you're not getting enough resources for missions, upgrading your base optimally or going down the right research track, are, these are big no-nos. You're gonna really quickly find yourself outpaced by the enemy, so you're only really barely able to complete missions, which earns you less rewards, which traps you in a failure cascade that is inescapable. If you've ever heard the term diminishing rate of returns, that's it. For a lot of people, the first failure is where they give up, and it only gets somehow harder with the War of the Chosen expansion in XCOM 2. It's a brilliant game, absolutely fantastic, super satisfying, and really enjoyable once you get going, but you gotta get going. And number seven is The Last Guardian, the PlayStation exclusive from 2016. Depending on who you ask, it's an unplayable mess or a brilliant masterpiece. The brilliant masterpiece side also recognizes that it is very tough to get into. If there's one thing we expect our games to be, it's consistent. When I press the jump button, I want to jump. Don't want the rules to be fuzzy, don't want to be unclear. You want to be certain when you choose to do something in the game, there's clear feedback that you did the thing. It all sounds very obvious, but the reason I'm saying this is The Last Guardian intentionally breaks this golden gaming rule. Intentionally. Let me repeat that word one more time. Intentionally. How it works is you play as a little dude, uh, but most of the puzzles involve guiding this gigantic bird cat dog creature called Trico around. How do you do it? Well, by shouting Trico and hoping for the best most of the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, the game is essentially press X to Sean. Not quite. Uh, like, in fact, Trico is a creature with a mind of its own, so sometimes it wants to do things and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to coerce them into acting with food or clearing out obstacles, but it's never entirely clear what Trico wants. This can lead to a lot of frustrating moments where you can't really tell what Trico's supposed to do, or even worse, when you know exactly what you want them to do, but Trico won't do it. It is uh, infuriating at times, very obtuse, and a lot of people give up on the game thanks to it. It's a game worth struggling through. The relationship between the boy and his giant monster is one of the most touching in gaming, and the whole thing ends in one of the most dramatic and intense climaxes in any game ever. Uh, for people who stuck it out, it's a worthwhile trip, but there's a lot of bumps in the road. The controls never quite feel like you're fully in control. And eventually, yeah, a certain logic does start to emerge, but it's never perfect. But a game can have some pretty serious flaws and still be great, especially one that tries to do something different, and The Last Guardian absolutely does. At number six is Prey, a game that definitely makes a good first impression. Uh, the opening sequence is still one of the all-time best, but once you get through the prologue, you're left with what might at first seem like a pretty middle-of-the-road FPS. The controls are a little clunky, and the entire story seems really basic at first, but as the game moves on, things just get a lot more interesting. What's unusual about Prey is that at first you really don't think about the potential of all the abilities at your disposal. The glue gun is a useful tool for slowing down enemies. Revive without using them to install new aptitudes. I've already updated your transcript with the list you requested. 
but it can also be used to create makeshift stairs and reach inaccessible places. The story seems very straightforward at first, until you realize just how many choices you actually have to influence events. The interesting thing is that the game doesn't just throw this stuff at you either, it lets things play out and adapts to what you do. What starts off as something that looks like a slightly more modern Bioshock is slowly revealed to be much bigger and more interconnected. The entire station is a living environment that changes as you progress through the game, with every area accessible from multiple angles and many different ways to resolve the story, all of which feel organic to the experience. Uh, hard to describe exactly what makes this version of Prey so special, but it basically took like an immersive sim idea like Deus Ex, but instead of it being a game that's split into a bunch of separate levels, it's one big immersive sim sandbox. It's a game that's easy to dismiss as maybe less scary than Dead Space, but there's a whole lot going on that makes it very different and great in its own right. And number five is the wonderful 101. Platinum games tend to be pretty tough on new players, but you'd think something that looked very kid-friendly and built exclusively for Nintendo consoles would be maybe a little more forgiving, but no. This is actually possibly their most inaccessible game. It's a game that looks like Pikmin, but plays like a cross between, well, Pikmin and Devil May Cry. The opening levels are constant chaos, constantly throwing new ideas at you well before anyone's mastered the basics. And they don't explain to you something that's totally essential, like the lock-on ability. Uh, in any other game, that would probably be pretty obvious, but this is a game with a really unique control scheme. On top of that, important abilities like the stinger attack and deflect have to be bought in the store, and they're mixed with a ton of less important crap. For new players, the game can be really frustrating and difficult to get a hang of, and because of that, a lot of people just give up. But for the players who stick with it, the game is actually one of Platinum's best. The depth and variety of the action here is literally second to none. It's over the top bonkers in its finale, and it, it, they haven't topped themselves on this one yet. Yes, uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance did come out after this game, and no, the finale of that game does not top it. So that's saying something. Uh, it's an extremely complex and unusual control scheme, and that takes some serious getting used to, but once you do, this is one of the best action games of all time. And number four is Dragon's Dogma, in many ways, a game that was way ahead of its time. Uh, that doesn't mean it didn't have a serious amount of jank to it, but its combination of Skyrim and Monster Hunter was extremely forward-thinking, even if the final product ended up a little strange in terms of how it mishmashed the ideas together. Even with that said, though, Dragon's Dogma is a brilliant game with a long-awaited sequel finally coming that could, in my opinion, potentially blow the roof off of basically any genre that went into it. At it's high time this original game gets the attention it rightfully deserves. And I think the reason it didn't get that attention is because it throws so much, so much at you right at the start. It's a tutorial after clunky tutorial interspersed with awkward gameplay that really doesn't effectively highlight how good the game is, particularly in its combat system. It takes a long time to really reveal how good the game is, but by that point, a lot of people had already given up. Everything about the opening hours of the game are just kind of head scratching. And even people who love it know that you just kind of have to push your way through that stuff before the game actually gets good. Once you start unlocking abilities, you team up with the team of pawns that actually do something and start fighting some giant monsters for real, then the game really starts to come together and becomes the janky but beloved classic that everyone knows it as today. The first few hours are rough though. <laughs> At number three is Rain World. Few games have a critical reappraisal like Rain World has, uh, which started out as a game that had a mixed reception at best and now has overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. Part of that comes down to how the developers have updated the game, but a lot of it just boils down to how people engaged with it. Rain World is, first of all, a brutal and unforgiving game. Its mechanics are obscure, its controls are unusual, and it's pretty easy to get yourself stuck in an unwinnable state. For any other game, that would be pretty damning, but for Rain World, it's somehow 
comes together and works. It's not a roguelike, and it's not really a Metroidvania, per se, uh, even though it does have all the appearances of one. It's more like a survival exploration game with a living ecosystem you have to learn to navigate and adapt to. I think what really throws people off, it looks like a cute platformer, but it's brutally difficult and obscure in a way few games are. You can easily take a wrong turn and end up in an endgame area right from the start. Uh, and unlike Dark Souls or something with this level system, and it's pretty obvious which enemies outclass you, this game, that even that kind of basic information, it's just not clear at all. It's the kind of game you got to be willing to really knuckle down and learn, and that's scared a lot of people off. But it's also brought in a lot of fans who have come to appreciate what it's trying to do. It's a game that's easy to get fed up with, but a lot of people who stick with it really love it. And number two is Dead Rising. It's the time limit. What, what else needs to be said? If you throw a big blinking time limit in a game, then I'm probably going to hate it at first. The entire Dead Rising series includes that kind of time limit. Your main guy, Frank West, who's covered wars, you know, starts off as a total chump. He's slow and weak, and there's zombies everywhere, so yeah, there's that. Just trying to keep within the time limit is a bit of a challenge, and for most people starting out, you're just going to reach a point where you run out of time and fail. Or maybe you die from the annoying convicts in the park. I don't know. Even if you love this game, there's no excuse for those guys. They are the absolute worst. The whole thing starts off slow and frustrating, and uh, having a ticking clock above something that is slow and frustrating, ooh boy, does that make it worse. Eventually, after a few hours, it does get a lot more fun, though. You start getting stronger, you learn new moves to deal with the zombies, the inventory gets bigger, and you learn where all the best weapons and healing items are, so fights are less of a slog. <laughs> People you have to rescue never get smarter, but at least they're pretty easy to babysit with a gun. Uh, Dead Rising remains probably one of the most unique and cool games that Capcom ever put out, but there are some real growing pains when you're starting out. The time limit. It's really, it's the time limit. And finally, at number one, the Souls series. Everyone who's played a Souls game has the story about when the game suddenly started to click for them. Sometimes it happens fast, sometimes it takes a couple games. Yes, the Souls series can take multiple games to get into, which that's like peak curiosity, an open-minded person right there. Good for them. Usually it goes like this though, you're playing the game, dying constantly, you're miserable, you're playing crazy defensively because you don't want to die and lose your souls, and when you do die, it feels like you've lost all your progress. When you're hating the games, the moment you lose 10,000 souls is the breaking point, and that's when a lot of people turn away and never look back. Some people eventually come back though, and with perseverance you're in one or two wiki searches, they eventually start to understand how these games are supposed to work. The funny thing is that the whole transformation has never really changed. The Souls games, which include Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and now Elden Ring, are really similar overall. Each game does have its own unique stats and confusing mechanics that aren't completely explained. Sekiro alone had the whole dragon rot thing, where if you died too much, certain NPCs would get sick and be inaccessible, and that could be enough to scare a lot of people away. Hell, Demon Souls, the first one, the one that started it all.